I was actually struck by both Orshi and Kira. You open with sort of more modern theories as a way of entree into earlier material. And I wonder, just methodologically, if you could talk about that more. How, you, how does that work for you? How do you avoid the pitfalls of anachronism? And, and why, why use that technique to, to get us into these discussions of these earlier periods? Is this? <laughs> Who goes first? Uh, I think I, I, I had various reasons to, to, to open my talk with this. First, I think I just so difficult to relate to, to anything medieval for us, and I just wanted to make it relevant to us then, because we, we tend to think today that we read self, have books a lot, and it's something new, and it's just a kind of a, a modern um, phenomenon. But I think that uh, it, it's so interesting to see that medieval people have were concerned with very similar issues we are struggling today, and they had very similar psychological issues and problems they wanted to deal with. And I really wanted to make this uh, to 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 make it relevant or relatable to us. I, I have some of the same interest as well, making it relevant, not being you know, being able to explore ideas that people are exploring now. Um, but I also have some reservations in, in using um, modern ideas. The way I justify it for myself is that these two that I'm thinking of, conspicuous consumption and self-fashioning, really resonate with ideas that were contemporary in the 16th century. Uh, conspicuous consumption is re reminiscent of magnificence, um, which was known and discussed and used to justify the uh, lavish expenditure of rulers. It was seen as a duty, even, for rulers to spend in this way. Um, and then self-fashioning reminds me of something like Castiglione's Sprezzatura as well. Um, so I, I come at these with some reservations as well, but because I hear these important, I don't want to say echo, <laughs> um, <laughs> but these resonances, uh, with ideas that were contemporary in the 16th century, I think it's, it's acceptable to, to bring them in, especially if they help us understand uh, either the social phenomena or the art in, uh, in a new way or a deeper way. Thank you. And Michelle, I really am curious to hear about your broader project and you know, how, how this study of the Jamalians fits into, you know, what, what is your broader um, motivation for the study. And part of what I'm thinking is that as a non-Islamic art specialist, I, I feel like when you think of the medieval Mediterranean and cross connections with Western Europe, you think of Venice. And that's very well studied and very well known. So is your project making you know, the connections with France and central France actually more, more well known? Yes, thank you. Um, yeah, so, you know, centers like Venice, like Sicily, have been really overstudied in terms of, you know, how they sent, functioned as poles of commerce and trade in the medieval Mediterranean. Um, but what I'm interested in more is kind of the reception of Islamic art in Western Europe and what that meant for users and viewers of these, of these Islamic models. So, you know, like a prominent example is the pseudo-Arabic, like, like what I showed. And what I'm interested in this is this idea of harnessing the exotic and what that means for the social um, class of the people who are using these exotic models. And if that means that by using you know, pseudo-Arabic or any kind of other Islamicate images, you're kind of elevating yourself. Um, you're, set, you're situating yourself aspirationally to kind of emulate courtiers and nobles who could afford to, for instance, travel to that region. And so I kind of see, this is why I call my talk enviable, enviable Possessions. These are objects that you wanted to possess because um, it was a way for you to assert um, your social status. So, yeah. yeah. Now, do you, do you guys I have questions for each other? I mean, especially, I, I think your, Orsi and Kira, your papers really <laughs> did speak to each other. But if you have questions for each other, please, please feel free. Otherwise, I'm going to open it to the audience. I have a question to Kira about the, and the members of the confraternity. Do you know anything about that? Who participated in this? And was it specific to certain uh, social groups or nationalities? Or so, um, 
So the Crucifiso is it was a devotional confraternity. So it wasn't a national company mm -hmm. and it wasn't a professional association. Mm -hmm. So it's particular to the devotion to the crucifix. Mm -hmm. um, it was an incredibly elite society. All of the big names, the who's who of Roman society were members, the Colonna, the Carafa, the Farnese. Alessandro Farnese actually served as cardinal protector of the organization, Renuccio Farnese before him. Um, so they're certainly among the most elite. Mm -hmm. That said, there's a membership list that survives from mid-century, 1550 to 1557, and there are over 1,800 names in the Crotrophesis membership mm -hmm. list, including artists, artists that worked for the company, like Perino del Vaga in their chapel. Um, so although control was probably exercised by a rather elite mm -hmm. group, um, the, the membership was diverse and certainly devotion to the crucifix attracted a diverse mm -hmm. group as well. Um, I'll say that the elite status has actually presented some problems in studying the confraternity or, or in people's responses to it. I think because the idea that it's such an elite group comes with it, the idea that these devotions aren't really heartfelt. Mm -hmm. um, and my project aims to resist that. <coughs> Thank you, thank you for these papers. Um, actually, I have a quick question for Kira, um, and um, and also one for Michelle. Uh, Kira, um, to what extent uh, were these practices conceived of as uh, a, an innovation, um, a revival, um, or the perpetuation of practices that had you know had gone on uninterruptedly? I mean, in a sense, what was the um, what was the way, what, in what way were they placed in the context of, of invention or revival? Um, and for Michelle, if I may, um, to what extent was uh, this interest in, um, in Islamic um, pra uh, chivalric practices and Islamic art, um, to what extent was it consciously thought of as related to Islam or to, or to the Arabic-speaking Arabic Arabic world? Um, and to what extent was it, and if you will, just sheer novelty? Um, mm -hmm. I'm trying to, I mean, I'm ob obviously I'm thinking of anachronistic practices too, like, um, I don't know, the, the 18th century interested in Chinese or the, you know, the <coughs> 1900 Viennese interest in English things. Mm -hmm. I mean, those are those. Um, so, um, so, Kira and Michelle. Um. I'm trying to answer your question. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to think of the company's own words, um, of the archival records that I've read, if there's any sense in those records or in the statute books um, of, of feeling one way or the other. And I, I can't think of any particular um, great examples. I, I will say that obviously nothing develops out of nothing. And something like the, Holy, the Easter Sepulchre practice um, it is an extent, it's an exaggeration of an existing medieval liturgical practice. So this practice of symbolically burying the host on the altar had happened before, but usually in a small vessel. Um, what is innovative with the company's practices is this incredible uh, ephemeral architectural structure that is built for this ceremony. And I'll say that it also then leads into um, something like the better known, sometimes better known 40 hours devotion mm -hmm. um, that is institutionalized at the end of the 16th century by Clement VIII. Um, there's some important differences when it happens, uh, where it happens, and I would say also most importantly that in the Easter Sepulchre the host is buried. In the 40 hours devotion the host is exhibited. Um, but these are certainly connected um, to, to each other. Um, but I think that there's a sense, um, especially around the 1575 Jubilee, that this is unprecedented and new. Um, in many ways it was. The 1575 Jubilee, for instance, tra attracted 400,000 people to Rome. So something different is happening, something grander, uh, more conspicuous, if you will. <laughs> Um, so to respond to your question, is it novelty or is it conscious appropriation? I think it's a bit of both. Um, I think there's definitely 
a novelty aspect that plays into um, kind of the harnessing of um, these motifs. But I also think that this period um, in the medieval Mediterranean is also fraught with a lot of military um, conflict, right? Because the Crusades are happening and there's like a million of a million crusades that we can talk about. Um, so there is this very this there is this kind of antagonistic relationship that um, the Western European um, knights are facing with um, you know the Islamic world, and I think they're also living in that region at the time. And so I think you know this kind of appropriation cannot be merely seen as um, just a coincidence. I think there's something a little bit more um, conscious that's going on there. Yeah. You had a question for Osolia. Is that correct. Um, that was a really fascinating paper and really um, interesting and <coughs> quite convincing explanation for how these images are working. Um, the question I, ha I have has to do with gender. Um, and the fact that you have in your, you're painted in one image of a woman and the other image is men. And I'm curious if in the reconstruction, um, and perhaps you mentioned this and I missed it, but in the reconstruction that you're suggesting, um, is it possible that there would have been a, a female figure who would have been mirroring the female figure in the scene? And, and kind of along the same lines, um, I was really struck by how uh, the female figure in her distraction, the one element, at least one element that isn't the same as the mirror, um, and of course women, I think perhaps in all medieval cultures, this certainly happened in Byzantium as well, <laughs> women are often um, accused of, of the various ways that their mind wanders. One of the ways their minds often wander is to their own sort of self-cultivation and their physical appearance rather than their spiritual um, formation and cultivation of the, of the spiritual self. So I guess I'm curious in, in sort of multiple ways, um, it, how the image might be gendered if that demands a different kind of reconstruction for the paired image. Um, and I guess finally, and again, I'm sorry if you missed this, or I'm sorry if you said this and I missed it, but um, might it be possible that that entire set of images would be gendered um, in terms of the person who used it or the setting in which it appeared in particular? Is it perhaps a, a private, I wasn't really clear on scale, but is it a private set of panels that could have been in a woman's um, uh, private chambers or in some other environment in which her representation in a private setting would have been particularly relevant and sort of mirroring her own experience? Uh, so uh, I think that anything might have been on the other lost half. I, I just don't have any, any way to prove it, but there are around 30 surviving images of this iconography. In every single case, you have two men under the crucifix. And even in the case, the earliest example is coming from a mid-14th century codex, which was made for a Benedictine female monastery. And even in that case, the two person is man. And so, but I'm not sure whether it posed any problem for the viewer to, 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 to imagine herself in that place. But yeah, it's conspicuous that why, why only man? I, I don't have any answer for that. And the size of these, Polyptych is kind of a medium size, I would say. So the panel itself is like that. So I think it very much speaks for a, a, a private uh, environment for use, but whether it was a domestic one or a side altar, or I, I don't know. But yes, I, I think that the size itself is indicative of, of, of its function. Sorry, can I just? Piggyback on that, expand on that, because I was very curious. You described the panel as unique, and then here you're saying there's thir 30 or 40 other images. Yeah, were but these other images in manuscript form? No, they are mostly frescoes from oh. small village churches from Sweden and the uh, French, French Alpine region and all around Europe, but they are very rare. Interesting. Sorry, go ahead. Question. Oh. This is okay. I'm happy to defer. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, I, I, on the same topic, um, the six scenes for the distractedness, mm -hmm. are they consistent in the 30 examples? They are, so, uh, they are mostly the same, yeah. There are in instances there are small of them, but they are always mostly the same, I would say. The reason I ask is the conspicuous absence in the painted one is that you have a view of the city mm -hmm. and one of the 
scenes is clearly of the country, the trees mm -hmm. and so forth. And so it occurs to me that the two things for your reconst hypothetical reconstruction. One, you, would, you should ask whether the perspectival open wall on the left is mirrored on the right, which mm -hmm. would not be stylistically unsuited to the period. And if so, is the scene, if you would imagine that, the scene on the outside of that side is of the countryside, which mm -hmm. is the one missing from your repertoire. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, this just... Thank I you, don't that's... know whether the answer to the question about both should there should be two women or a man and that seems irrelevant. I don't think we could know that. Uh, but if the repertory is consistent, mm -hmm. you might do better in a reconstruction not to rely on the print but mm -hmm. to use its mm -hmm. its references mm -hmm. okay. a Thank little you. more strongly. Thank you. Thank you. That's very helpful. So. Um. Thank you very much for these tremendous talks. I enjoyed them very much, and I'm totally envious of each of your fields now, because you're all working <laughs> on objects that are fabulously interesting, and I wish I were doing that too. Um, uh, I just For Michelle, like, I kind of have a, an idea or a comment, and I'm not sure if it translates into a question exactly. Um, my area is uh, mid-century American painting, but I'm very interested in color. Mm -hmm. And I'm noticing in the objects that you're looking at um, that A, they're copper, as opposed to the Islamic antecedent objects, which seem more often to be brass, mm -hmm. and that the chromatic um, material, or the, sort of what you, the, the colors that you see on the gemellions that you presented, which constitute the full set of objects I've seen that I know now, mm -hmm. <laughs> um, seem to emphasize a verdigris color, which is very mm -hmm. similar to the color that Kira is wearing in her sweater. Maybe a little bit darker. Yeah, there you go. And what's interesting to me about that is, be, is in this period in, in the ancient world, color is often associated with geography. And I mean, the most obvious example is lapis lazuli coming, you know, ultramarine coming from Afghanistan um, and other colors, as opposed to verdigris, which is a very kind of locally producible color. And if they're making these gemellions out of copper, that's how you make verdigris, right? And if they're washing their hands or feet with any kind of wa water that's got an acid in it, mm -hmm. um, like vinegar, if they're doing it to kind of key up the washing aspects, that copper's gonna turn that color. Mm -hmm. And so I'm wondering if there's not only a kind of referencing of the antecedent imagery, but also a kind of play with l color that's produced, mm -hmm. that you can produce on the spot as opposed to by expensively from a remote location, and in fact, you can see it sort of turn that color gradually, mm -hmm. and then you gotta clean it. But the enamel remains as a kind of reiteration of that color you're gonna get if you get that slightly acidic water in, in the basin. I think that might have a lot to do whether, however, with like whether or not these are actually objects that get used, or if they're kind of heraldic objects that represent cheaper versions you actually would use. I don't know what your, if that any of that is, connects to what you've been thinking about in terms of these objects? No, definitely. And so for the color, the most often color that you do see on Limoges enamel in general, not only on the gemellions, is this kind of like verdigris, yeah. Um, and that is the cheapest and the most commonly available color. And so this, the range of colors that you find on Limoges enamel ranges from you know green to being the cheapest to red is the most expensive. So if there's a lot of red on your enamel, that means it cost you a lot of money. Um, but I did, not, I did not think about kind of like the chemical reaction that copper might um, provoke. So thank you so much. Um, <coughs> my question's uh, for Orshi. And um, knowing nothing about that fascinating object, I wanted to know if um, a wandering mind is at all similar to a melancholy mind at the time. And um, like seeing a depiction of a very fraught relationship between a figure's mental state and the sort of surrounding objects, I couldn't help but think of like Durer's famous Melancholia print. Are they like similar at all in terms of historical overlap or sort of mental state, or are they totally different sorts of things? Uh, I'm not an expert of human theories. Uh, and so I would say that 
as far as I understand, uh, the, the wondering why it was a more universal human condition. To be melancholic, you, well, you were more exposed, uh, more tr prone to be melancholic if you had certain kind of humors in your body. But the wandering mind happened to everybody. It, and that's where I would put the difference between the two of them. Um, or she, my question is for you too, and along the same lines. I was um, looking at the the wandering mind and all the the different and and looking at the different activities and where your mind can go. And I was I was thinking about like what what about sex and sexual activities? <laughs> like, how, is that at all uh, depicted as one of the places where the wandering mind may go or mm -hmm. shouldn't go? I think it's, um, the woman is the uh, kind of the subtle uh, signifier for this problem, I think. And that's, but there is no more explicit reference for, for sex. But obviously in, in, in contemporary literature it has been, yeah, addressed as one of the problems which might distract you from <laughs> looking at the passion. <laughs> <laughs> There is the bed in the manuscript that <laughs> illustration that you showed us. Um, it, and I have, sorry, you're getting a lot of attention, but <laughs> obviously it's the richest of your material. Um, it, I just would, wanted a clarification, a question for clarification. In the, the, um, the panel with the woman, the, the lines, I, could, I can't quite tell, but mm -hmm. they don't seem to be protruding directly from her head in the same way that I could see on the manuscript. Is, are they, they seem less yeah. organized, like they're, attached to the shelf and the rod. Yeah, yeah, they are less organized than, than in the woodcut. And, and I cannot tell because it's, it was the exterior, so it was, it's more damaged, and that's why the lines are not so well organized. But on the other hand, I think there is an interesting link between the woodcut and the panel, because in two cases, the lines are exactly at the same spot, crossing the two fields. Uh, uh, and I think it shows to certain kind of uh, connection between the woodcut and the panel. And I wondered if there's one there's one line that seems to go off to the right, and if you thought that could potentially have a... Do you think that's any kind of connection with another panel, which wouldn't make sense, because then you'd have the other figure. Th there's one that's sort of going off to the right, and then is cut off by the right edge, as I'm recalling. Uh, all of them are cut there. They are all running to the right. Um, to m my... Left to the well, <laughs> to the <laughs> as I'm looking at it, <laughs> they're all running to the window that's on the the left. No, Never mind. it's not important. Okay, okay. Do any of the red lines go to the head? So, which are you talking about? The the, the panel? Yes, yes. The pa panel uh, so f runs to the head of the woman. And for, or from the head of the woman to the other side of the lost half. It's hard to tell them connecting to yeah, the yeah. head. Is, that, is it just that we're not seeing it? On yeah, it's that? difficult to see on the slides, sorry. More questions? <laughs> we are at the end of the symposium. <laughs> How are we doing on time? We're okay? Okay. Maybe we've run out of steam. Um, <laughs> so, um, unless there are more questions, I think we're going to wrap it up. And um, thank you to everybody who participated today and um, to everybody who came and listened. We're really grateful um, to have you here. So thank you, and I'll see you all on April 15th. Yeah,